Welcome to the Alex Jones Show on this Sunday, August 9th, 2015. I'm David Knight, your host today. We're going to be taking a look at the debates. Things are still unfolding. We have developed into a soap opera. Not any more light on the issues that we should be looking at. Of course, issues weren't really covered. As one person pointed out, this wasn't a debate. It was an inquisition by Fox News. And so that is now expanding. We see that happening in the last couple of days. There's been some de developments uh, between Fox News, between Megyn Kelly and Donald Trump, the back and forth personal vendetta. So we're going to talk about that. But I want to uh, go over some of the news in this particular segment that we have. We're also going to, of course, look at some additional information that's come to light about Chris Christie. Was he telling the truth in this back and forth between Rand Paul and Chris Christie? That was one of the few moments of the debate that really got to anything that I think touched on some of our serious problems. The rest of it was really essentially personal attacks on a lot of these individuals. We're also going to talk about Ben Carson's comments uh, post-debate. We're going to look at some more information about the Bush family and Planned Parenthood. We're going to look at some new revelations that are up on InfoWars about how some of this tissue is being used with Planned Parenthood that they are passing on. And we find that Donald Trump has actually been on the right side of vaccines. Now, this was a few years ago. This was back in 2012. This is a story up on InfoWars.com. Trump opposed vaccines, and he warned of autism. He's been on the right side of the war on drugs as well, but we haven't heard that in this debate. He also said you're not going to stop the massive crime with the war on drugs unless you decriminalize it. Well, he came out and warned about the connection between autism and vaccines. And he says, I know that a lot of people don't like to hear that, but uh, I don't really care. And that's that's the thing about Donald Trump that it's good. I hope he will, he will continue to talk about these issues. But then we also have to ask, since he's being quiet about it, even if he does talk about it, will he do anything about it? We've seen so many politicians. We've seen Ronald Reagan. We've seen Boehner McConnell. When they're running for office, they say one thing. When they get into office, they do another. And so that's one of the things that we're concerned about. We see that there is a massive leak by the EPA. The EPA, of all people. They have leaked over a million gallons of toxic waste into the Animas River in Colorado and is now going down into New Mexico. What would they have done? to any individual, any company, if they had done that. Now, they didn't do it deliberately, but of course, a lot of times we have accidental spills. They would have absolutely destroyed anyone else. Maybe the EPA is too busy trying to take over our energy grid, trying to shut down coal to really pay attention to their key mission, which is to protect the environment. They have become the destructors of the environment. We're going to talk about that story in detail. If you live out west, you need to know about that. If you live in Colorado, New Mexico, it's now headed uh, further south as well. It will spill out of that. We're also going to take a look at college loans. Do you realize that delinquent college loans are one of the main reasons that many doctors are losing their license? That's how rigorously they go after college loans. You can't dismiss them in bankruptcy court. We've had situations in the past where the Department of Education has actually used SWAT teams on families because they had a family member. One particular case, the mother was delinquent in her loan. They raided the remaining family, the father and the children. They drugged them out in the wee hours of the morning, put them face down on the lawn with guns drawn in their face over a delinquent college loan. And now they're taking the licenses of doctors. This is the kind of authoritarian, out of control government that we have. But of course, we're not seeing any discussions of those types of things. We're not seeing any discussions of the Trans-Pacific Partnership, this deal that's being done in secret. None of these questions were asked at the debate. Rather, it was personal, it was petty, it was vindictive. We're going to take a look at that when we come back. The soap opera that has become the debates. Megyn Kelly putting herself not only center stage at the debate, literally, but also center stage of the presidential race after the fact. Stay with us. We'll be right back. We're going to be taking a look at some more information that has come to light with the presidential debate. And, of course, the back and forth between Megyn Kelly and Donald Trump has gotten even larger. Many events have happened in the last couple of days. And we're going to try to even talk about some issues that matter. But first, I want to let you know about what's happened out west with the EPA. I think this is a wonderful example. I shouldn't say wonderful. It's a horrible example of how our government actually operates. When we bring the government in to solve a problem, in many cases they make it far worse. They become the problem. Here we now have out west at the Animus River 
It's been fouled by one million gallons of contaminated water from a mine. The EPA accidentally released this water into the river. It affects Durango residents, and this is going down now not only from Durango, Colorado, but it is now going down into New Mexico and headed further south. They say a spill that sent one million gallons of wastewater from an abandoned mine into the Animas River turned the river orange. It set off warnings Thursday that contaminants threaten water quality for those downstream. The EPA agency confirmed that it triggered the spill while using heavy machinery to investigate pollutants at the Gold King mine north of Silverton. One of the people there, Daniel Silva, 37, who's fishing near Durango, said it's a sad day. The fish could be gone. I'm safety oriented. Working in the oil fields, we take measures every day to prevent leakage. Why didn't they? If this kills the fish, what do we do? Well, see, that's just it. The EPA created the spill. They failed to warn the residents of it. They failed to contain it because they're too busy trying to take down the power grid by executive order and by regulations that they write. Not laws written by Congress, but our agencies like the EPA and the IRS, they continue to write their own laws. Once they're created by Congress, Congress abdicates their authority to write laws to these agencies. These agencies then write the law have their own enforcement agencies, their own courts, their tribunals that you're hauled before where you are guilty and must prove your innocence. You have no, uh, in these regulatory disputes, you do not have the presumption of innocence. But what's the EPA doing? Well, here's another article. EPA crew accidentally, accidentally turns the Animus River orange. They say a federal cleanup crew caused a big, potentially hazardous mess in Colorado. One person says, when I first saw it, I was speechless. The river did not look real. But in person, it truly looks like the river has turned into carrot juice. And in the article that we have on Infowars.com from RT, it says toxic waste, including arsenic and lead, which seeped into a river in southwest Colorado, has now crossed the state border into New Mexico. More than 550 gallons per minute are entering the water flow system, according to the EPA, which caused the spill. They say aside from lead and arsenic, federal officials say the spill also contains cadmium, aluminum, copper, and calcium. They say high levels of arsenic can cause blindness, paralysis, and cancer while lead poisoning can create muscle and vision problems in adults and can be fatal for children. They say the sediment, the metals, are, the sediment are going to start to settle out in the stream bottom. As we have storm surges, as we have flooding events, that sediment can and likely will get kicked back up into the water. We're going to have to do ongoing monitoring. Exactly. This isn't something they can easily clean up. It's going to settle down into the water whenever it gets agitated. This is going to be a constant problem for this very large area. Again, it was caused by the EPA. Sloppy work. This was a mine that was abandoned in 1923, says the EPA spokesman. So typical. No accountability. Will anything happen to the EPA people? No. Will they lose any funding? No. They will likely get even more funding. Every time the federal government fails, every time one of these agencies fails, they say, well, if only we had had better salaries, equipment, more people, whatever. We need more money. Every time they fail, that's the continuing excuse. I want to turn now to look at the aftermath of the debate. And, of course, really what has become the petty soap opera of Megyn Kelly and Donald Trump. What I would call, as the world burns. Now, when you last tuned in, Megyn Kelly glared at Donald Trump and accused him of demeaning women. That was on Thursday. Now, emotional relationships are breaking up as friends are choosing sides, as a nation focuses on the melodrama of hurt feelings. Stay tuned tomorrow for another episode of As the World Burns. Because as the world, we've got real problems here, but these people have become the problems. You know, when you look at what they're doing, and, and this really is like a soap opera. As uh, one columnist wrote of the Daily Dramas, they say, all those soap operas are melodramatic events. They usually have the luxury of a space that makes them seem more naturalistic. In other words, they can go on and on and on. And that's precisely what we're seeing with this. Now, of course, what everybody is making a big deal out of this weekend is the fact that as Megyn Kelly came after Donald Trump with this vitriolic hatred in her eyes. And you can really see that in the questioning. I was really amazed when I looked at it. 
He said, well, you can see what she was doing. She had blood coming out of, her, out of her eyes, blood coming out of her wherever. Now, everybody is saying that that was a reference to her being female, to menstruation. Really? He said eyes. Are they suggesting that Megyn Kelly is now some kind of weird genetic modification uh, <laughs> from Fox's sponsors? I don't know. That was, a, that was a strange expression that he had, blood coming out of your eyes. I don't really understand what that means. I, maybe it's something from New York. I don't know. My wife had an expression. Her friends, when I met her from, uh, from Brooklyn, from New York, it was, uh, we're sweating bullets. I, you know, I never got that either. I don't know. Maybe blood coming out of your eyes is something like that. But seriously, as Donald Trump says, only a deviant would misunderstand this Kelly remark. And I have to agree with him on this one. I think that what Megyn Kelly is doing is far more demeaning to women than Donald Trump. I think she's really showing that she's not ready to be in the position that she's in. She's put herself center stage during the bait. Literally, she was in center stage, and now she is still in center stage. This is about her hurt feelings. The question was about her hurt feelings. Look, Donald Trump calls everybody he doesn't like fat, stupid slobs, not just women. He's equal opportunity. That's the way the guy rolls, okay? He insults everybody like that. This isn't something that was targeted at women. And as many people went back and talked to the lady that she said, well, it was, it was worse than that. You said you'd like to see so-and-so on her knees as part of the uh, TV reality show that you had. And the lady that that remark was made about said she didn't even remember that, that he had always acted as a gentleman. There was never anything demeaning about it. Megyn Kelly was putting this feminist chip on her shoulder. She's making it all about her. She looks petty. She looks vindictive. She looks like somebody that doesn't deserve to have the job, but is there because of the way she looks, because she's playing identity politics. I've thought that for a very long time. I mean, really, when you go back and you look at some of the things that she said on the war on Christmas, yeah, we all know that Santa Claus is white, or even worse, when you look at the things that she did and pushing mandatory vaccines without informed consent, saying, is it Big Brother? Yeah, of course it's Big Brother. Sometimes you need Big Brother. We've seen that happen before as well. We also saw uh, Eric Balling with uh, Fox News and the aftermath of the shootings in France crying like a baby practically that we need to over-militarize the police, that many people are saying that the police aren't militarized enough. We need to over-militarize the police. That's what we're seeing from Fox News. Now, one of the things that they came after, and I think it's a legitimate criticism of uh, Donald Trump, was his connection in terms of supporting the Clintons with money. And if you want to know who supports the Clintons with money, it is not just Donald Trump. There's a lot of people in the mainstream Republican Party, especially mainstream Republican media, like Fox News. Take a look at this article. Fox News trying to take out Trump for the GOP establishment. This was on uh, CNN's Outfront Breitbart News editor said the very first primetime debate was, quote, a great debate between Fox News anchors and between Donald Trump, with establishment Fox trying to take out the businessman and the GOP frontrunner. He also said that pollster Frank Luntz's declaration that the primetime debate was, quote, the destruction of a presidential campaign for Trump is, quote, wishful thinking. He said, we saw last night's debate, which was a great debate. It was a great debate between the Fox News anchors and between Donald Trump. And we're going to talk about that in more detail. Because as many of you who've watched this program know, I'm not a fan of Donald Trump. But I'm also not a fan of the trivial nature in which these debates are being held. Stay with us. We'll be right back. As we're talking about what people have been calling Bloodgate, the back and forth between Megyn Kelly and Donald Trump. The comments that he made this weekend about how she had acted at the debate. I think it's really not so much that as it is a fox hunt. This is what many people were saying, and this is really what Donald Trump was reacting to. They say Fox News trying to take out Trump for the GOP establishment just before the break. I read the comments from Breitbart News Editor-in-Chief. He said it was a great debate between Fox News anchors and between Donald Trump. He said there was also, I enjoyed the Chris Christie Rand Paul spat. That was good too. But for the most part, what we saw was that Fox was on a mission, a mission to take out Donald Trump. Well, Fox has got a lot of missions. Actually, Fox is on a mission to push the militarized police state, the police industrial surveillance complex, if you want to call it that. What used to be just Pushing wars is now pushing the war on drugs and terror as a war against American citizens. You know, when I look at this Fox debate, 
it really started out with a pledge, didn't it? Isn't that interesting that it wasn't a pledge to obey the Constitution? It wasn't, will you take a pledge to restore the rule of law, to restore the Constitution? No. It was a pledge to the party, to this artificial construct. And quite frankly, I could care less about the GOP. I could care less about the Democrat Party. Partisan politics is one of the things that's really wrong with this country. The founders despised partisan politics. They thought it would be the ruin of the country, and it is one of the things that is ruining this country. Who cares about a loyalty oath to the GOP? This is the same GOP that's run by John Boehner and Mitch McConnell. Those guys could care less about the people who elected them. They could care less about the promises that they made. When you do have congressmen who do care about the promises that they made to voters and try to stand behind them, they're punished by the leadership. And that's why there's a movement right now within the GOP to try to take down John Boehner. At first, they just laughed it off. They said, well, <laughs> we're going to pull this up to a vote, uh, but maybe we should check first. When they checked, they found out that they were so close, they were afraid to call the vote. So they're going to wait until the five-week recess. And you can imagine there's going to be a lot of lobbying going on with that. So, but let's get back to the debate. I, I want to run the clip where they talk about the Dark Act, um, where they asked, where Fox News asked the candidates what they thought about this Monsanto Act, where they're not going to allow the accurate labeling of what is in your food. They're going to shut it down at the federal level because they're afraid about all these referenda that they've had at local and state levels, where they've lost a lot of these. So they want to shut it down at the national level. Let's play that clip. Oh, that's right. We don't have that clip. Sorry. The guy's back there scrambling. Sorry, guys. I didn't mean to do that to you. I know we don't have that clip. Let's play the clip on the questions about police brutality and the militarization of the police. Oh, that's right. We don't have that clip either. Those questions weren't asked. Nor were the questions asked about the war on drugs that's been failing for 44 years or rule by executive order. They did have a little bit of that in the junior varsity debate. They asked the candidates there. They said, what would you do? with Obama's executive orders. Well, on day one, they, every single one of them in the JV debate said on day one, I would repeal all of Barack Obama's executive orders. What was left unsaid was that they would not repeal George W. Bush's executive orders or Bill Clinton's executive orders or George H. W. Bush's executive orders. No, they're just fine with those. It's only Barack Obama. Let me tell you something. They're not going to repeal anybody's executive orders. We haven't seen any president do that. We have an out of control presidency. We have an out of control bureaucracy. The presidency as it now stands is something that's not manageable for any individual because this is not the institution that was designed by the founders of this country. It's not the institution that was defined in the Constitution. Why don't they ask them some questions about the revival of the Cold War, bringing us to the brink of World War III? Why don't they ask them questions about the Federal Reserve? Why don't they ask them questions about the Trans-Pacific, the Transatlantic partnerships that are being negotiated in secret that have been fast-tracked by the Congress? Many of the people who are running for president voted to fast-track this. They don't ask them about the new pre-crime push. They don't ask them about asset confiscation without trial. They don't ask them about indefinite detention by the military without trial. None of these questions are being asked. None of the questions that are destroying America, that are remaking us into an authoritarian, totalitarian society, no questions about that. No questions about the fundamental things that are destroying us economically. They don't ask them questions about the problems of America to see if they have any solutions. Because Fox News and the rest of the media, like most of those politicians on the stage, are the problem of America. They represent the biggest problem that we have in America. Absolutely, totally devoid of any real discussion. And the media, for the most part, is not even talking about it. The real exception to all of this, of course, is Rand Paul. And they brought Chris Christie in. I don't believe the guy even qualified to get into the debates. You can play games with polls. You can make polls say anything you want. I remember they kept Gary Johnson, two-term popular Republican governor of a Democrat state. They kept him out of the debates by not including him in the polls. They said, well, you have to poll to a certain level, but they didn't even put his name in the poll. They kept Ron Paul out of the debates many times. So they can play these games. They can include who they want, exclude who they wish to keep out. I believe they kept, they put Chris Christie in as a bulldog to attack 
Ron Paul to shut down any discussion of some of the important issues of civil liberties that we face. Because Ron Paul is one of the few candidates, is, is, is the only candidate that I know of, that actually has talked about the police state, police brutality that's out of control, the massive surveillance state. None of the others are talking about that whatsoever. But look at Chris Christie. International Business Times, and this was the day before the debate. They said Chris Christie's, actually the day of the debate, this was August 6th, so this was Thursday. Chris Christie's lowest moments, only 30% hold a favorable opinion of the new Jersey governor, a new poll found on Thursday, the day of the debate. They said only 30% of registered voters in New Jersey had a favorable opinion of Chris Christie. Asked to justify their negative assessments, 18% cited his character. They didn't like him because of his character. They didn't like him because of his attitude. They didn't like him because of the image as reasons for unfavorable feelings. Another 10% used terms like untrustworthy, deceitful, and liar to describe Chris Christie. You could put me in that group. Chris Christie has not experienced any kind of 2016 announcement bump in the ratings from voters back home. In fact, quite the opposite. Typically, you see that. Usually when somebody is a, a sitting governor and they say they're going to run for president, usually they get a bump in popularity. Instead, Chris Christie went exactly the opposite way. Now, I want to play the uh, guys, if you can cue up that, uh, that clip between Chris Christie and Rand Paul. I'd like to play that. When we get back, and I want to talk about something that Chris Christie said. Remember they said that he was unpopular because he was untrustworthy, deceitful, and a liar? 10% of the people used those terms to describe Chris Christie. 10% of the people that they asked in New Jersey where he's governor. We're going to show you how deceitful and what a liar he is in the lies that he had going back and forth with Rand Paul in the debate the other night when we come back. Stay tuned. We're going to go back and dissect this Chris Christie ran Paul debate and I'm going to show you some of the blatant lies that Chris Christie told as part of this debate. Before we do, I want to let you know that we have extended free shipping but it will end tonight. We have still free shipping on everything at infowarslife.com and we have Survival Shield. We we've extended that sale 30% off of Survival Shield X2. And we still have the sale on Silver Bullet. Buy two Silver Bullet, get two free. That's our colloidal silver product, free of artificial additives, perfect for your preparedness supply. As a matter of fact, you want Survival Shield nascent iodine as well for your preparedness supply. Silver Bullet has 30 parts per million. It's in a base of pure deionized water. You can get Silver Bullet and Survival Shield X2, both on sale and both with free shipping. Now's a good time to stock up on your preparedness products and that sale, we have extended it now twice, but tonight is definitely the end of the free shipping on everything at the store, as well as the end of those two sales. Buy two Silver Bullet, get two free, and 30% off Survival Shield X2 Nascent Iodine. Those will both end tonight. So this is a good time today to get those specials. Getting back to what Chris Christie said, as I was mentioning before we went to the break, on the day of the debate, they did a poll and found that he was at the lowest he has been, got no bump for running for president as most candidates do when they're sitting governors. 10% of the people that uh, did not like him said, uh, use the terms to describe him as untrustworthy, deceitful, and a liar. Only 30% held a favorable opinion of New Jersey Governor Chris Christie. And let me tell you, a good example of this was the debate the other night. There's a back and forth, and we're going to play that for you, as to whether or not we should have dragnet surveillance, whether or not we should give carte blanche to the police state to spy on everyone all the time to keep us safe. Should we give up all of our liberties for security? Chris Christie is on one side of that, adamantly says, yes, we need to do more than the government is doing, far more than the government has been doing. And, of course, he was working with the government in the early part of um, the Patriot Act to do just that, working with the FISA court to do just that. Rand Paul is on the other side of that issue. So they were going back and forth. And at one point, Rand Paul talked about how Chris Christie had hugged Obama after Sandy Hook. And then Chris Christie comes back and says, well, let me tell you about the people that I hugged after 9-11, because I was appointed as someone to track down these terrorists after 9-11. Now, we're going to play that for you, and you're going to hear him say twice how he was nominated on September 10th, and September 11th was the very first day that he took office. Actually, that's another Chris Christie lie. 
International Business Times pointed out that when he said, I was appointed U.S. attorney on September 10th, 2001, I spent the next seven years of my career fighting terrorism, putting terrorists in jail. Yeah, I guess he was the guy who, did he catch all those terrorists who did 9-11? Maybe he was the guy that found the passport that floated down from the terrorists after they blew up the plane into the building. That passport just magically floated down to the top of the heap. There of all the rubble on 9-11 and somebody found it. Maybe that was Chris Christie. Maybe that was his contribution to put those terrorists in jail. He says, we have to give more tools to our folks in order to be able to do that. Then we have to trust those people. Yeah, we can trust Chris Christie, can't we? We can trust him to lie. We can trust James Clapper to lie. We've caught him in lies. We can trust Michael Hayden to lie. We can trust Carly Fiorina to lie because she's been working. The only job she's had in government is to work with Michael Hayden to cover up their dragnet spying. But we're supposed to trust her. Now, here's the reality. He was not appointed on September 10th. 2001, the day before September 11th. He didn't take office on September 11th. Here's the press release from the Office of Press Secretary for George W. Bush. This was done on December the 7th, two months later. Said President George W. Bush today announced his intention to nominate three individuals, and one of those was Chris Christie. So the announcement was December 7th, 2001. He was nominated by the president two months after Chris Christie is saying. And then they say that he was named, and this is on Chris Christie's own site, his own bio at the state of New Jersey, Governor Chris Christie. If you look down and look at this, Chris Christie was named U.S. Attorney for the District of New Jersey in 2002, not September 10th, not September 11th, 2001. He was lying about that. He was lying about that to wrap himself in the clothing of emotionalism that they've used to push the police state on us. This article from The Nation says, Rand Paul's eye roll marked the end of the 9-11 era. They say, and here's a quote from Chris Christie, the hugs that I remember are the hugs that I gave to the families who lost their people on September 11th. And The Nation says, Senator Rand Paul at that moment engaged with Christie on a debate about mass surveillance and then gave what we'll unilaterally dub as the most monumental eye roll in presidential debate history. Paul's smirking, get a load of this guy dismissal of Christie's ghoulish grandstanding is a nice final line for an important political chapter. It's the moment we knew for sure that September 11th had lost its currency even in Republican politics. Paul wasn't immediately booed. Nor was he shredded by the moderators, nor was he condemned as a terrorist sympathizer, or worse, as certainly would have been the case during the Bush years. In fact, in the Drudge Report's instant reaction online poll, Paul finished fifth with Christie dead last. But of course, that's not what we're being told by Fox News. That's not what we're being told by MSNBC. They're telling us that Paul just, he came across as just too mean-spirited. We need to get in the face of people who are destroying our country, who are taking our civil liberties and not giving us anything in return. This is a false promise of security. Going back to the nation, they say the eye roll moment was a long time coming. It was foreshadowed in 2008 by the spectacular failure of Rudy Giuliani's noun and verb 9-11. He used it both as a noun and as a verb in his presidential campaign. They say in Thursday night, Prove that September 11th has finally been stripped of its potency as an animating event, even for Republican voters. Well, that's both good and bad. It's good that people are finally waking up to that. Not that they are indifferent to the suffering of the people who died on 9-11. But they know that it was that the government, everything the government has done before and sense to spy on us was absolutely irrelevant to that. Even if they don't believe that it was a false flag event, they understand that this has nothing to do with protecting us. It's simply taking our liberties. As Benjamin Franklin said, if you'll give up your liberty for security, you don't deserve either one. We know throughout history that when you give up your liberty, you don't get security. You become a slave when you give up your liberty. That's what you become. You, work, you live in a maximum security state. That's another name for a prison. Slaves never have security. When you give up your individual rights, you become a slave. Get that through your head. You need to understand that. Hopefully, people are starting to understand that. But of course, 
If it's losing its currency, that is also a dangerous moment before us because this government may feel like it needs to pull another 9-11 in order to justify more encroachments to scare us into giving up our liberties. Let's play some of that back and forth debate. On the stage who's actually filed applications under the Patriot Act, who have gone before the federal... Uh, the Chris Christie bla- bragging court, about how he's violated people's liberties. ...and investigated and jailed terrorists in this country after September 11th. I was appointed U.S. Attorney by President Bush on September 10th, 2001. And the world changed enormously the next day. There's a lie. It happened in my state. This is not theoretical to me. It's just a lie for him. We lost friends of ours in the Trade Center that day. My own wife was two blocks from the Trade Center that day at her office, having gone through it that morning. When you actually have to be responsible for doing this, you can do it. And we did it for seven years in my office, respecting civil liberties and protecting the homeland. And I will make no apologies ever for protecting the lives and the safety of the American people. We have to give more tools to our folks to be able to do that, not fewer, and then trust those people and oversee them to do it the right way. As there you go. That is exactly what that I do. That lying authoritarian guy who accuses Rand Paul, who stands up for the Bill of Rights, he says, when you say that, you're just full of hot air. No, he's the one who is full of hot air when he takes our freedoms and destroys the rule of law. Stay with us. We'll be right back. We were just telling you about the outright lies of Chris Christie, posturing, wrapping himself in the victims of 9-11, as we've seen Rudy Giuliani and many others in the GOP, using that to create an authoritarian, totalitarian police state, destroying the rule of law, destroying our civil liberties, shredding the Constitution and the Bill of Rights. We've had enough. The nation said this perhaps was the first time that we've seen that this doesn't work. They said when Rand Paul rolled his eyes at the narrative that was laid out there by Chris Christie, wrapping himself, justifying all these encroachments on individual liberties, justifying it as protecting us from 9-11. When Rand Paul rolled his eyes, perhaps that was the beginning of showing that this is over in terms of being able to sell tyranny, using 9-11 to sell tyranny. We're going to go back and we're going to give you Rand Paul's response to that and then Ben Carson's response to this back and forth exchange between Rand Paul and Chris Christie. Before we get back to that, just want to let you know that the free shipping that we extended for another, now it's 10 days past the end of July. We had free shipping through July. We didn't really push it that much. Towards the end of July, as we started telling people it's approaching towards the end, people started taking advantage of it. So with it being this time of of year when many people are on vacation, and not able to take advantage of that, we decided we'd extend that for another uh, week, actually, to 10 days. But it will end tonight. And that's everything at the store at InfoWarsLife.com. Free shipping, including things like Super Male Vitality, which has been out of stock for several weeks, is now back in stock. But we do have a couple of specials, and those will also be ending tonight. Survival Shield X2 Nascent Iodine, 30% off. We put that on special on Friday, and we've now extended that till uh, tonight. It will end tonight, as well as the buy two silver bullet, get two free. That will also end tonight. So that's 50% off of silver bullet, 30% off of Survival Shield X2, and free shipping on everything in the store. That all ends tonight. Now, getting back to the... To the clip, we won't play the Chris Christie uh, for you again, but basically what he said was he was appointed U.S. attorney on September 10th, 2001, and I spent the next seven years of my career fighting terrorism and putting terrorists in jail. Well, he didn't support that. I don't know how many terrorists he put in jail. I don't recall any of uh, that he's put into jail, but we do know because we can look at the documents. We do know that he was not nominated until two months later. Not on September 10th, not on September 11th, but on December the 7th, 2001, George Bush, has. we have the press release that we're showing you on the screen. It shows that he uh, nominated him for the position of U.S. Attorney for the District of New Jersey. And then on Christie's own website on the state of New Jersey, it says that he became U.S. Attorney for the District of New Jersey in 2002. So he was nominated in December and then didn't take that office until sometime in 2002. But, of course, he pretends that he was there on ground zero, hugging people and arresting terrorists. Absolute total nonsense. Here's the way Rand Paul responded to that bull. Go ahead, sir. I want to collect more records from terrorists but less records from innocent Americans. 
The Fourth Amendment was what we fought the revolution over. John Adams said it was the spark that led to our war for independence. And I'm proud of standing for the Bill of Rights, and I will continue to stand for the Bill of Rights. And, and Megan, Megan, that's a, that, you know, that's a completely ridiculous answer. I want to collect more records from terrorists, but less records from other people. How are you supposed to know, Megan? Pause, so, that. What you Pause that. Pause that. Pause that. How are you supposed to know who's a terrorist? Because in Chris Christie's mind, every American is a terrorist. You're all guilty unless he spies on you and vets you and determines that you're innocent. How are you supposed to know who's a terrorist and who isn't unless you do dragnet surveillance of the American people? That's what Chris Christie is telling us. Pull it up again, because he goes on to say, when you talk about the Constitution and Bill of Rights, you're just blowing hot air, because that's what he blows when he talks about the rule of law, this, this shill of a lawyer. Go ahead, play that. Are you supposed Use to, the no, I'll tell you how you look. Get a warrant. Let me tell you something. You get, go, a get a warrant. When you, uh, you know, Senator. Go ahead, wait, Governor Christie, make your point. Listen, Senator, you know, when you're sitting in a subcommittee just blowing hot air about this, you can say things like that. When you're responsible for protecting the lives of the American You can talk about getting a warrant according to the Fourth Amendment when you're just sitting in a committee. Is to make sure that here's you use the, problem, the system governor, the way it's supposed here's to work. the problem, yes, Governor. You fundamentally un misunderstand the Bill of Rights. No, he despises Every time it. you did a case, you got a warrant from a judge. I'm talking yes. about searches without warrants, there is indiscriminately no of all Americans' records, and that's what I fought to end. I don't trust President Obama with our records. I know you gave him a big hug, and if you want to give him a big hug again, go right in. And... And you know, you know, Senator Paul, Senator Paul, you know, the hugs that I remember are the hugs that I gave to the families who lost their people on September 11th. Those are the hugs I remember. And those had nothing to do, and those had nothing to do with politics. Unlike what you're doing by cutting speeches on the floor of the Senate, then putting them on the internet within a half an hour to raise money for your campaign, right. and while still putting our country at risk. All right, we're That's cut it off there. He's putting our country at risk. No, it is Chris Christie who's putting our country at risk. Because we don't have a country if we give all power to the government and we have no individual liberties. But of course, Ben Carson didn't see it that way. He went on the Hugh Hewitt program. And of course, Hugh Hewitt is a hardcore neocon conservative type who wants uh, to prosecute a war of terror against the American people. He wants to prosecute a war of drugs against the American people, just like everybody else on that stage, except for Rand Paul. Never saw any civil liberty that he thought that Americans should have. And so he gets Ben Carson on and kind of asks him about the debate. Let's play that clip. But what was the most surprising thing to you as a first timer on a debate stage That's Hugh Hewitt. Uh, from tonight's proceedings? Here's Ben Carson. Well, I didn't, uh, I didn't expect to see some of the people go after each other so vigorously. I, I, I really expected much more civility than that, but I guess that's the nature of the beast. I'm, I'm not likely to engage in such activities. Who do you remember as being the least civil on the stage? Probably Rand Paul. And, and towards, towards Chris Christie, is that the exchange you're referencing? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, would, yeah there we go. Well, let me, the let me remind these two guys. Let me remind these two guys of what Goldwater said. Once upon a time, conservatism meant people who respected the Constitution, who respected individual liberty. That meaning has changed, just like the meaning of the word liberal has changed over the decades. What Goldwater said, of course, the famous quote, extremism in defense of liberty is no vice. We don't have to apologize for that, Ben Carson. Extremism in defense of liberty is no vice. Moderation in pursuit of justice is no virtue either. I would suggest that uh, what Ben Carson should do is he should spend some time educating himself on the Constitution, on the Bill of Rights, on how our government works. Maybe he could start with some uh, uh, schoolhouse videos or something elementary like that. Would he operate on somebody without understanding human anatomy? Where are you going to start if you want to be president? Maybe you ought to go back to the founding documents that all of these people who take office, whether it's president or somebody at a lower office, they all swear allegiance to the Constitution. Ben Carson, 
Why don't you read the Constitution as if you're reading anatomy before you go into surgery, okay? I don't want somebody, elected president, doing surgery on our Constitution and on our country because we've had too much of that. People who don't know and who don't care, who have a cavalier attitude. Can you imagine somebody going in for brain surgery, somebody, a brain surgeon, and he has an absolute cavalier attitude. Yeah, well, you know, I, you know I've, I've kind of seen pictures of the brain or whatever. You know, I'm, I'm kind of, I can't really get too excited about it. But uh, that's exactly what we have here. Somebody who wants to be president, but he can't be bothered to read or understand the Constitution. This is somebody who said about the right to keep and bear arms that, well, yeah, it's something that I can understand people need to have guns out in rural areas. But people in the cities, no, it just creates problem. Really? You haven't even bothered to understand what's behind that. You have no concept of individual liberty. This is somebody who, as a doctor, said that we ought to take away people's informed consent for vaccines. He even flunks medical ethics. Ben Carson even flunks medical ethics, let alone the ideals of individual liberty that we have in the Constitution. Don't tell me that we need a civil candidate. We need some candidates who understand what the issues are. And I only saw one candidate on the podium that demonstrated that he did, and that was Rand Paul. Don't talk about how he needs to be more civil. We need to get more angry about people who are glibly denying and taking our liberties and the rule of law. Stay with us. Welcome to The Alex Jones Show on this Sunday, August 9th, 2015. I'm David Knight, your host today. We're going to be taking a look at... The debates, things are still unfolding. We have developed into a soap opera. Not any more light on the issues that we should be looking at. Of course, issues weren't really covered. As one person pointed out, this wasn't a debate. It was an inquisition by Fox News. And so that is now expanding. We see that happening in the last couple of days. There's been some de developments uh, between Fox News, between Megyn Kelly and Donald Trump, the back and forth personal vendetta. So we're going to talk about that, but I want to uh, go over some of the news in this particular segment that we have. We're also going to, of course, look at some additional information that's come to light about Chris Christie. Was he telling the truth in this back and forth between Rand Paul and Chris Christie? That was one of the few moments of the debate that really got to anything that I think touched on some of our serious problems. The rest of it was really essentially personal attacks on a lot of these individuals. We're also going to talk about Ben Carson's comments uh, post-debate. We're going to look at some more information about the Bush family and Planned Parenthood. We're going to look at some new revelations that are up on InfoWars about how some of this tissue is being used with Planned Parenthood that they are passing on. And we find that Donald Trump has actually been on the right side of vaccines. Now, this was a few years ago. This was back in 2012. This is a story up on Infowars.com. Trump opposed vaccines, and he warned of autism. He's been on the right side of the war on drugs as well, but we haven't heard that in this debate. He also said you're not going to stop the massive crime with the war on drugs unless you decriminalize it. Well, he came out and warned about the connection between autism and vaccines, and he says, I know that a lot of people don't like to hear that, but... Uh, I don't really care. And that's that's the thing about Donald Trump that is good. I hope he will he will continue to talk about these issues. But then we also have to ask, since he's being quiet about it, even if he does talk about it, will he do anything about it? We've seen so many politicians. We've seen Ronald Reagan. We've seen Boehner McConnell. When they're running for office, they say one thing. When they get into office, they do another. And so that's one of the things that we're concerned about. We see that there is a massive leak by the EPA. The EPA, of all people, they have leaked over a million gallons of toxic waste into the Animas River in Colorado and is now going down into New Mexico. What would they have done to any individual, any company, if they had done that? Now, they didn't do it deliberately, but of course, a lot of times we have accidental spills. They would have absolutely destroyed anyone else. Maybe the EPA is too busy trying to take over our energy grid, trying to shut down coal to really pay attention to their key mission, which is to protect the environment. They have become the destructors of the environment. We're going to talk about that story in detail. If you live out west, you need to know about that. If you live in Colorado, New Mexico, it's now headed uh, further south as well. It will spill out of that. We're also going to take a look at college loans. Do you realize that delinquent college loans are one of the main reasons that many doctors are losing their license? That's how rigorously they go after college loans 
You can't dismiss them in bankruptcy court. We've had situations in the past where the Department of Education has actually used SWAT teams on families because they had a family member. One particular case, the mother was delinquent in her loan. They raided the remaining family, the father and the children. They drugged them out in the wee hours of the morning, put them face down on the lawn with guns drawn in their face over a delinquent college loan. And now they're taking the licenses of doctors. This is the kind of authoritarian, out-of-control government that we have. But, of course, we're not seeing any discussions of those types of things. We're not seeing any discussions of the Trans-Pacific Partnership, this deal that's being done in secret. None of these questions were asked at the debate. Rather, it was personal, it was petty, it was vindictive. We're going to take a look at that when we come back. The soap opera that has become the debates. Megyn Kelly putting herself not only center stage at the debate, literally but also center stage of the presidential race after the fact. Stay with us. We'll be right back. We're going to get back to politics in just a moment, but as we were covering news in the last break, I just wanted, there's a couple more news items I wanted to get to that were just kind of stand alone on their sides. Of course, one of these is student debt, the rising cost of college. And we're seeing the federal government now floating the idea that everybody should get a free college education or that college uh, student debt uh, should be relieved by taxpayers to the tune of $39 billion or more. This is what a student debt relief program would cost taxpayers. I'm sorry, but I shouldn't have to pay for other people's debt that they willingly entered into. Debt in many cases that they took on for getting some kind of a degree that had absolutely no relevance. You want to go to school and you want to take some kind of a sociology degree or a woman's study degree or whatever, fine. Pay for it yourself or go into debt for the rest of your life if you're going to pay these ridiculously expensive uh, figures. But don't ask me to pay for it. On the other hand, we see that the government that is now offering itself out there as this benevolent savior to these people has been incredibly rigid and unforgiving with those who do have student debt. As I mentioned earlier in the program, we've, we've had situations where people have been SWAT teamed, entire family SWAT teamed over the debt of one individual. In the particular case I was talking about reported by the Washington Post, this was a family drug out in the middle of the night, SWAT teamed with shotguns to their heads, and they were looking for the mother of the family who had left the family. She had skipped out not only on her student loans, but she had skipped out on the family. But the rest of the family got SWAT teamed. That's not an appropriate way to try to collect debt. But that's the way the government does it. And, of course, they're going to take that debt if they do taxpayer relief. And they're going to transfer that debt to the rest of us. And we'll get SWAT teamed if we don't pay for it, if we don't pay our taxes or whatever. But now look at this other aspect of it. Not just SWAT teaming people for their delinquent loans, but this is from the uh, IJ Review. They say the reason doctors and nurses are losing their licenses has nothing to do with their job performance. They say it's a group consisting of doctors, teachers, nurses, engineers. What do they have in common? Doctors, teachers, nurses, and engineers are having their licenses revoked not due to malpractice, not due to lawsuits, but because of student debt. They say since 2009, over 4,200 Tennessee residents alone, this is just in the state of Tennessee, 4,200 people have joined this group because of non-payment on their student loans, reports the Chattanooga Times Free Press. Registered nurses and nurse aides are among the most likely to be affected because they're not making that much money. Many people get a college degree without ever looking at whether or not this thing is going to pay off for them financially. They go into massive amounts of debt. And you cannot dispel your student loan by declaring bankruptcy. And if you go in and you finally get a job, they can take your license. Whether you're a licensed engineer, whether you're a doctor, whether you're a nurse, they will take your license. Now, how does that make any sense for the government to do that? Because now those people are not going to be able to pay it back. It's the same thing that they're doing to the nation of Greece as an entire nation. They're not interested in getting it back. They just want to be punitive. It's a very frightening scenario when we see the Fox, uh, the uh, the uh, banks doing that. And I said Fox because I'm pulling up this next article here. This is an article from Fox 8. Just a sign of the times. Target is going to move away from gender-based signs. They say, attention Target shoppers, say goodbye to girls' building sets and boys' bedding. 
They say they're going to start phasing out gender-based signage in some of their departments. That's what Target is going to do. Well, that certainly should make Megyn Kelly happy. Maybe Fox News can be their next sponsor. This is a Fox article that goes on to say that parents and gender equality advocates welcomed the news. Really? Not this parent. I understand that there's a difference between boys and girls. I understand there's a difference between men and women. I think that's a good thing. I think that it's a we have a complementary relationship between the sexes. I don't think everybody needs to be the same. This is a brave new world agenda that they're pushing here. This is an agenda that destroys the family. This is something that's being pushed not only by Target, but by Fox News, saying that parents are welcoming this. They go on to say that some people don't like this. A small minority of commenters criticize Target for their politically correct fads. So most parents applauded, according to Fox News, but a small minority of us don't like that. Let me tell you, when my sons were young, they were only a couple of years old, and we got a little car for them. That, we, that my wife found on Craigslist, and she got a good price on it, and you know, it has a little battery on it, and the kids can sit in it, and it, and it moves like about one mile an hour. And so we got it for the two boys, and she came home with it, and I said, Karen, that's pink. The boys aren't going to want that. And I had not told them anything about pink being a girl's thing or whatever. It was basically a Jeep, but it was colored pink. And the boys walked out, and they had a fit. I'm not getting in that thing. I mean, they understood that there was a difference. They instinctively wanted to pick up sticks and use them as guns. My daughter instinctively has never done that. Okay, she's always wanted to cuddle and nurture things. There's a difference between men and women. You can make everybody the same, but you're going to have to force the issue. And the only reason you would do that is because you want to create a brave new world society. Destroying the family, this is an old old technique that authoritarians have always used. It goes all the way back to Plato's time. We've talked about this many times. In Plato's Republic, he wanted to have a situation where nobody had any loyalty to any institution other than the state. They want to replace the family. They want to replace God. In Plato's Republic, no one even knew who their parents were. He wanted to have a promiscuous society where everybody was intermixing all the time. Nobody knew who the parent of their child was. And they were separated from the mother at birth, so they didn't know who the mother was. So their only loyalty would be to the state. And now we have pushed the age that we turn our children over to the government earlier and earlier and earlier. And it still isn't enough for them. Now they're coming for us in other ways. And just understand, this is coming from Fox. Fox News, the place where conservatives go to get their news. The place that if you look at their programming, has some of the most gender-bending, anti-family pushing programs. They've had that for decades. But of course, that's where we go to get our news. And they say, Fox 8 says, the change is a step towards removing gender limitations in childhood. But when one of the world's largest retailers does this, the ripple effect will be significant. There we go. Isn't that great? Let's get back to the politics of what's going on here. There's an article about Google's search engine algorithm. They say that it could steal the presidency. They say, imagine, this is from Wired Magazine, imagine an election, a close one. You're undecided, so you type in the name of one of the candidates into your search engine of choice. And they say, let's not be coy here. It's going to be Google for the most part. Great. Now you're an informed voter, right? No. A study published this week says that the order of the results and the ranking of positive or negative stories on the screen can have an enormous influence on the way that you vote. They say the, if the election is close enough, the effect could be profound enough to change the outcome. You think? Of course it can. Of course, they can skew the way that you think by putting positive uh, articles at the top or negative articles at the top for a particular candidate. That's precisely what Fox News is doing in this debate. They decided they wanted to come for Donald Trump. They decided they wanted to come for Rand Paul. And they made no bones about it. And they've still been doing it. And I, I've mentioned over and over again how I'm not a fan of Donald Trump because of his business practices. But I am also and even less of a fan of the, of the media being used to influence the public that way. They say, you, we report, you decide. No, they're telling you what to decide. The way they use Frank Luntz to manipulate public opinion, people are sitting there watching this, and he says, look, I have this scientific reaction from my study group, and they liked this part, and they didn't like this part. It's like, where did this guy get his study group? 
Anybody ever ask that question? Does anybody ever question what Fox News is saying? Of course, the people are going to look at this. They're going to have the playback that is carefully collected and carefully skewed to one candidate or the other. They can declare over and over again that Carly Fiorino won. Why would they do that? There's somebody that has been deeply involved with the CIA and the surveillance state. The only government experience she's had is that. And she hasn't had that much corporate experience either. Six years as a failed CEO, 50% drop in stock. We'll be back. Stay with us. And we're going to take your calls in the next segment. If you want to call in, that number is 877-789-2539. That's 877-789-ALEX. We have a different number on Sundays. So that's 877-789-ALEX if you want to call in. We've been talking primarily about the aftermath of the debate. What does that tell us about the sorry state of the media, especially, but also about the politicians who are offering themselves as our next batch of leaders? We're going to talk a little bit more about that. But before we get to it, I want to let you know that today is the end of free shipping at InfoWarsLife.com. You can still get everything for free at InfoWarsLife.com, uh, free shipping. We also have a couple of specials that will be ending today. Uh, in addition to the free shipping, we have 30% off of Survival Shield X2 Nascent Iodine. And we have a buy two silver bullet, get two free. So that's 50% off of silver bullet. Those are both products that are great to have in your preparedness supply. Silver Bullet and Nascent Iodine. We also have Super Male Vitality. It's now back in stock. It is not on sale today, but it is now back in stock. And you can get free shipping on that if you want to uh, get that today. Again, the free shipping will end tonight along with those two specials, 30% off Survival Shield X2 and Buy Two Silver, Get Two Free. Those will both end tonight along with free shipping. Getting back to what we were talking about in terms of the uh, debate. Well, actually, before we do that, let me let me tell you about this article that's up on Infowars.com by Steve Watson. Latest unedited Planned Parenthood video confirms that aborted babies are being sold to create super mice. Now, again, this is a kind of transgenetic modification, combining elements of one species to the other. We don't like to see that in our food, and I certainly don't like to see that in our animals aborting and using children for this kind of franken science listen to this the brains of aborted babies are being transplanted into mice in labs now this is uh, taken from the scientist and the journal of neuroscience they're indicating that they say essentially the fetus brains are minced that's the actual words used in the paper published in the journal of neuroscience and the glial cells cells that support neurons in the nervous system were extracted and injected into lab mice. The mice incorporated with the glial cells from these human babies into their brains, quote, outperformed normal mice almost fourfold in the variety of cognition tests. Now, this would almost be funny if it wasn't so gruesome. It's kind of a pinky in the brain type of science, but it is absolutely disgusting. And of course, there were some questions in the debate on Thursday about involvement with Planned Parenthood. One of those was put out to George, uh, to Jeb Bush, and he said, no, um, they, they questioned him and they said, you were director of a Bloomberg Foundation that gave $10 million to Planned Parenthood. I said, I, I didn't know anything about that. I was in that Bloomberg Foundation because I wanted to enact Common Core. <laughs> That's a great excuse, isn't it? So he's director of a foundation with Bloomberg pushing Common Core and giving $10 million to Planned Parenthood, Jeb Bush, one of the Bush clan. But then in his defense, he said, no, no, I am a pro-life governor. Let me tell you, we cut off funding to Planned Parenthood. And I thought, well, it'd be interesting to see how much money he did cut off from Planned Parenthood. Well, here's what they did. He, two vetoes that he did. He vetoed line item vetoes. Bush vetoed $115,000 in funding for Northeast Florida Planned Parenthood in Duval County. And he vetoed $187,000 for Department of Health contracts with Planned Parenthood of Collier and Sarasota County. So if you load that up, combine those two, that's about $300,000 in state funding to Planned Parenthood that George Bush vetoed. However, his private foundation gave 30 times that amount to Planned Parenthood, over $10 million. So on the one hand, he publicly, the public face of Jeb Bush, says, oh, I'm cutting uh, funding to Planned Parenthood, and he cuts $300,000, but then privately, along with the Bloomberg Foundation, 
Jeb Bush gives them $10 million. How's that? 30 times as much. That's the kind of hypocrisy that we see coming from these people. That's the kind of mask that they wear. And as we pointed out last week, and it bears repeating again, back in 1947, Prescott Bush ran the first national fundraiser for Planned Parenthood. Their national goal at the time was $2 million. Remember inflation going back to 1947. Look at this letterhead, guys. Get a copy of this, because here's a, a blown up picture of this letter. On the stationery, on the top, left-hand side, we have Margaret Sanger, honorary, honorary chairman. Thank you. Sorry. And then on the right-hand side, we have Prescott Bush, treasurer. So Margaret Sanger on the left, Prescott Bush, grandfather of Jeb and W on the right as treasurer for their first nationwide campaign. And the letter was signed by Margaret Sanger. And here's some of what she says. This means the coming of age of our organization. The enclosed pamphlet, the nation's strength, outlines our plans and our objectives. It will mark the first major step in integrating Planned Parenthood and the health and welfare services of the country nationwide plan. This is not an appeal for funds. We wanted you to know in advance what our plans and our hopes are. So this is Prescott Bush, treasurer, working with Margaret Sanger, when it became known that he was working with, at the time it was called uh, the Birth Control Society, he l was knocked out of an expected victory of a Senate seat in 1950. But then, of course, he later got involved with that. And, of course, it was not only the grandfather, but, of course, George H.W. Bush and Barbara Bush have been very actively involved in raising money for Planned Parenthood. We have a letter, and we talked about this at the end of the last week, in March of 1972 from George Bush about raising money and working with the people at Planned Parenthood to help them raise money. And so we see then that the grandson now, Jeb Bush, is part of an organization that gives $10 million to Planned Parenthood while trumpeting the fact that he shut off $300,000 of state funding. That's the way it goes. Oh, he also got rid of the... Uh, Planned Parenthood license plates. They haven't done that in Virginia. We have the story from Kit Daniels on Infowars.com. Virginia has banned the Confederate flag plates, but not the Planned Parenthood plates. You can still get those in Virginia, just not a Confederate flag plate. But of course, we should think that George, that Jeb Bush is pro-life because he banned Planned Parenthood plates in Florida and cut one thirtieth of the amount of money that he and his private organization donated to Planned Parenthood. And then this last thing about Jeb Bush. Eight months ago, the day after Christmas, it came out in the Daily News that Jeb Bush had resigned from a company that had cashed in on Obamacare. They say his presidential ambitions are looking healthier now that he's dropped out of Obamacare. Tenet Healthcare Corporation, he was on the board of directors there. They've made a lot of money, they say. They paid uh, from Obamacare, and they paid Bush $2.3 million dollars from 2007 to 2013 as he was a director on a company that profited from Obamacare, just as he was a director of a company that donated $10 million to Planned Parenthood. That's pro-life Jeb. You don't need to understand that Jeb Bush is anti-life. You can look at what happened with Terry Chavo. You don't have to just look at his donations, but the money trail does talk. His father, his grandfather have all been involved in Planned Parenthood, and so is Jeb Bush. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Today, we're going to go to your calls in just one moment. If you want to call in, you can uh, reach us. It's a different number on Sundays. That number is 877-789-2539. Again, that's 877 789 Alex, that's our number on Sunday, if you'd like to call in and join the program. Before we go to our callers, just briefly, Greek banks have lost half of their value in this last week. You know, they've closed the stock market in Greece for about five weeks. And they not only shut down the supply of cash, but they stopped all stocks from being traded. And as you remember, they opened that back up on Monday, immediately the stocks lost about 23% of their value. They had to stop trading on many of the stocks. They, Throughout the week, they gradually clawed their way back up. They say now the stock market is down around 16%. However, it's much worse than that for the banks. They say Attica Bank has lost over half of its value, is down 53%. 
The National Bank of Greece is down 52%. Alpha Bank has paid is, is down 61% off of their share prices. In one week, this is done to the Greek banks what it took Carly Fiorina to do to Hewlett Packard six years to do. <laughs> she took their stocks down 50%. That's serious, folks. When your stock goes down 50%, that's the way these people finance their organization. And as we're talking about, Greece is inching closer to a third bailout deal. But Fins are insisting that the rescue package will not work. They're not talking about an 86 billion, billion euro deal. Now they're looking at 100 billion euros. It keeps getting bigger and bigger. One last thing on Greece, and then we'll go to your calls. This, I think, tells the story, and this is which nation has the worst dependency ratio? Here's the dependency ratio, the number of non-household members each worker supports. In other words, this is the number, if you're working, you have to support yourself, you have to support your household. How many people outside of your household do you have to support? Well, in Greece, that number is six. By far and away, they have the highest ratio. So besides themselves and besides their household, the worker has to support Six people outside of the household. That's the kind of burden they have. The one next to that is Italy at four. That's why Alex Jones was saying it looks like Italy may be the next one on the list. Where is the USA? We're at two. That means that besides yourself and your household, you have two dependents outside of your household that you have to support. Who's the best on the list? Canada at only about a third. So they have quite a few less dependents outside of their family that they have to support. Now, all of this plays into the Cloward and Piven strategy that the Obama administration is doing here in the United States. Currently, we have to support two people outside of our household. They're working to change that very rapidly. That's what this open borders and lavish welfare benefits for people who are not citizens, who did not even bother to get legal permission to come into this country from all over the world. That's what this is all about. Cloward and Piven, of course, the two socialist economies, economists who came up with the idea that we need to, in order to remake the various countries into their socialist paradise, they first need to destroy it before they can rebuild it. We heard that narrative, of course, in the last Captain America movie, that was uh, the Robert Redford's character was saying that. We have to destroy this country so we can rebuild it the way we want to. And, of course, that's happening in a number of ways. It's happening with the destruction of the Bill of Rights and the Constitution and the due process and the rule of law. But it is also happening economically. And that's what this is about. Taking the country down with a unsustainable welfare state so then you can rebuild it into their communist utopia. And we're not that far behind Italy and Greece. We are far worse than Canada. Again, the dependency ratio of implied public reliance is one-third for Canada. It's two for us. And the worst case basket cases are four and six. And we're going to rapidly approach that. Let's go to our callers now. Let's go to um, Mark in North Carolina. Mark, you wanted to talk about Bush and Christie, you said? Go ahead. Yeah, the first thing I wanted to say was about... Uh as far as Christie goes, <clears throat> sorry, I think Paul was too gentle with him. Yeah. You've also reminded him that Christie wanted to uh, uh, force states like Colorado, use federal force basically to um, uh, get them to uh, let go of their uh, marijuana laws. In other words, that they should, that, that even though they legalized it, he would force them to uh, illegitimize it. And exactly. He was, he was going to, he said that if he becomes president, he's going to force uh, Colorado and Washington states that have decriminalized marijuana, he is going to remove that as president. And let me ask you, Mark, uh, what's the constitutional authority for that? Well, he has no car, uh, constitutional authority. That's actual state's right. That's right. The thing is, they, use, they talk about the civil rights movement sometimes, but what they don't understand is you have, everybody has constitutional rights. The Bill of Rights is for everybody. And when a state denies people their constitutional rights, as they did with black people in certain southern states and some other states, too, then it is a federal responsibility to do something. But this isn't the case of marijuana. You're not violating it. Nobody's rights are being violated in the state of Colorado. They have every right. They decided, the people decided they want to legalize marijuana. Now, the other thing I wanted to talk about with Bush. Okay. Well, wait, before we leave that, before we leave that topic, we had an article up last week and it said the federal government has, doesn't have the right to ban anything. 
And we know that's the case because of alcohol prohibition. They had to have a constitutional amendment to ban alcohol, to prohibit it. And we got another one, the 21st Amendment, that, that made it legal again. Why did they need that? Because there is nothing in the Constitution that says the federal government can ban alcohol, that they can ban cancer drugs, or that they can ban marijuana or anything else. They don't have that right. The Ninth and Tenth Amendment says if you're not explicitly given the right to do something, that power is retained by the people, by the states. So they have no legal basis for the war on drugs whatsoever. And as far as guns go, really, that's what the federal government probably should interfere because, again, people's civil rights, their constitutional rights are being denied in states like New York or Christie's, New Jersey, okay, Where, uh, whereby it's almost impossible to even own a gun, to even have one in your home, let alone to have one to be able to carry one. So I, that's where the federal government probably should interfere because these are illegal laws that the states are depriving people of their civil rights, constitutional rights. The other thing I want to talk about the Bush family is I'm just uh, finishing up this book called um, Family of Secrets. It's by a guy named Russ Baker. And um, this is a really a sleazy family. I personally believe, first of all, Prescott Bush was definitely in support of Hitler, as well as Planned Parenthood. Oh, yes. Yeah. We know from the bank connections about that, yes. Go ahead. W. Bush, I believe, and is good evidence, not only in this book, I read other books too, like Jerome Corsi's book, all that, it's H.W. was involved in JFK's murder, and I also believe he was involved in the shooting of Ronald Reagan because the Bush family and the Woody and the Hinckley family were actually very close friends. A lot of people don't know this. I yeah. looked it up. I knew this before, too, and I looked it up just to make sure. They were actually close friends. Too many coincidences happened with the Bushes. And on top of it, H.W. was actually in the CIA long before he became director of the CIA. Oh yes, we were we were told that he what, didn't have any involvement with the uh, uh, with the Bay of Pigs or anything, and yet it just turned out that uh, two of the ships that were there were Zapata and Barbara were the name of them. And of course, what was uh, HW's oil company? It was Zapata Oil, and his wife was Barbara. Why would they pick George Bush to head the CIA at its lowest point? after the church committee hearings, just because the guy was heavily involved in the CIA. Obviously he was, he's part of that mafia, part of that, that gangster mafia. Go ahead. On top of all of that, the Bushes, and not only the Saudis, but the actual bin Laden are very close together. Bin Laden actually, uh, what if, I think bin Laden's brother actually owned a company though they tried to cover it up a little bit in Houston years before, I think back in the 1980s. This family is, I'm telling you, this family is dirty, um, Dave. Some oh, absolutely. To push it out. Absolutely. Very dirty, and, and we can see the same types of stuff that we see with the Clinton family and all the issues with corruption, with crime, with people around them committing suicide. That's what we see with both of these families. We have essentially a Game of Thrones with a couple of different mafia families pushing this through. And, of course, that's what uh, Fox News is helping out. We're going to have a quote here from Michael Savage when we come back. I want to read to you about this debate. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Welcome back to the Alex Jones Show. We're going to go back to your calls in just a moment. We're trying to get through as many of these as we can in this, our last segment. Before we do, I just want to let you know that free shipping ends today. We extended it from the month of July, but it will end tonight. And that's free shipping on everything at the InfoWarsLife.com store. We also have some additional specials that will also end tonight. That's Survival Shield X2, 30% off of our nascent iodine. That's one of the best ways that you can get iodine. Of course, it's in a liquid form. It's a very, very pure form of iodine. It protects your health. And also, we have buy two silver bullet, get two free. That's 50% off with that special. That will also end tonight. That's our 30 parts per million colloidal silver and a pure base of deionized water. It's free of artificial additives. It's perfect for your preparedness supply, as is Survival Shield X2. And one last thing, it's not on sale, but Survival Mail... Uh, Super Male Vitality is now back in stock. So Survival Shield X2 Nascent Iodine, sale of 30% off. Silver Bullet, we have at 50% off. If you buy two, you get two free. And Super Male Vitality is also back in stock. Everything at InfoWarsLife.com, free shipping. But that ends tonight as well as those other two sales. Let's go back to your calls and let's try to get through people as quickly as we can. Let's go to Antonio in FEMA region number nine. Antonio, you wanted to talk about the election. Go ahead. Hey, David, uh, you call me in line. I'm over here at a store shopping right now. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah. If, 
Go ahead. You no, want me to come back to you? No, or? no uh, I have no problem. Uh, I'm just there. Uh, I'm anyways. Sorry, don't worry about my problem having over here. <laughs> over here. Anyways, uh, I just wanted to know like your thought on the debate. You know, I think Rand Paul performed very well, and like the whole show about how um, he didn't get much time. You know, of course, it was the Donald Trump show. All of a sudden, it feels like we're on NBC watching like The Apprentice. You know, it was all about Donald Trump. But like, what were your thoughts? You know, uh, well, I thought he had the on? only. I thought he had the only back and forth. And again, they put Chris Christie there. I think the only reason they put him in the debate was so that he, that he could check Rand Paul because we don't want to have somebody that's actually talking about how the government is destroying the rule of law and taking our individual liberties and shredding the Constitution. I think that's a very valuable role that Rand Paul is serving here. And I think he spoke that very, spoke for those causes very well in the very brief amount of time. Of course, he got a lot less. Even the next person uh, got about 18, 20% more time than he did. Uh, uh, the people who got the most amount of time, of course, were the Fox newscasters. They were the ones who gave themselves the most time because it's really about them front and center. And that's what we're really seeing about uh, Megyn Kelly. She made this all about uh, what uh, Donald Trump said. Of course, you know, when he talks about men and women as being fat pigs and slobs, it's really childish rhetoric. But... Yeah, and it makes him look bad. I think it makes uh, Trump look bad to talk like that, but it's not necessarily racist or sexist. She wants to take it that way. If he says that she's bleeding out of her eyes because of the vitriol and the hatred that he sees coming out of that, he says, or or whatever. I think, personally, I don't think he was referring to menstruation. I mean, uh, bleeding out of the eyes, really? <laughs> I think that they're twisting that. Uh, but, of course, it's really about her narcissism, her feminism, putting herself at the center of the debate, literally. Uh, she's revealed herself, I think, to be a token anchor babe, and uh, they managed to avoid any real serious questions, any real serious issues or solutions. They made it all about a bunch of nonsense. Actually, what uh, Michael Savage said, he said Obama got away clean in the debate. Apparently, it was Trump who was the enemy. Think maybe Fox wants a Democrat victory so it'll keep their ratings high with discontented conservatives. That's what Michael Savage said. I think he's right about it. He says, think about it. Why would pro-Republican supporters want to provoke and antagonize a leading Republican candidate? Well, you got Lindsey Graham coming out and saying it's better for a Democrat to win the White House than Donald Trump. That's what he said this weekend. Lindsey Graham. There we go. So um, thank you, Anthony. Uh, Antonio, I want to go to uh, some of the other, other callers so we can try to get through as many people in this short time we have. Let's go to uh, Monty in North Dakota. Monty, you wanted to talk about the election. Go ahead. Yes, sir. I would like to talk about the Republic of the United States and the Republic for the United States. Are you there? Yes, go ahead. They were created in November of 2010 and was created by people from a majority of the states in the de facto corporation coming from as far away as uh, Hawaii to Ephraim, Utah, to create a legal form called the Doctrine of Sovereign Intent, which has been recognized by at least 90 nations of the world and presented to the UN. And it, well, I haven't really heard of that. What what is the name of that again? Republic. No, the only word you need to change when you look for it in the computer is "oven for." Republic of the United States or Republic for the United States. Do you have a website that you can get people so they can look this up? Because we don't have time to go into a lot of detail. I want to get to some of the other callers. Do you have a website? I would say Republic for the United States dot org or Republic of the United States dot org. I'm not a computer person. Okay. All right. Well, we'll give that out to people. You just gave that out to people. And I think we need to all start looking at ways that we can cut off Washington. I think this whole thing with the 2016 elections, especially when you focus on the very top of the ticket, I've had a lot of experience with third-party politics, and I know that what they tried to do, first of all, was to keep people off the ballot. They always give ballot access to the Democrat and Republican parties. They're free to choose their candidates however they wish. They can do it with a primary, they can do it with a caucus, or they could just appoint them if they want to. There's nothing about how they get their candidates on, but they reserve a spot for them on the ballot. 
If you want to come in as an independent or as a third party, it becomes extremely difficult for you to get in. And to retain ballot access, they typically do it in most states, certainly they did it in North Carolina. They made it a requirement that we had to get 10% of the vote for either president or for governor in an election in order to stay on the ballot as a third party. So they want to try to focus you on the things where you're going to have the least success, the least amount of, of uh, uh, impact, and that's on these highest races. And we have our minds set on these things. We talk about this because there are some vital issues, and we can talk about how these are reflected in these candidates. So it's good for us to talk about it, and it's good for us to talk about it because other people are talking about these issues or non-issues, as, as it turns out, uh, what the debate turned out to be. But we need to understand that our real solution is going to be in doing something in terms of state nullification, in terms of jury nullification, or in terms of what this fellow was just talking about, creating some other alternative organizations that stand against this. I, I agree with that. Let's go to Howard and Philly. You want to talk about the debate? Go ahead. A uh, couple, couple, couple things, David. One, have you noticed the uncanny resemblance to uh, Claire Underwood and House of Cards of, uh, that's Cecile Richards from... Uh, I don't watch House of Cards, but I did notice an uncanny resemblance between Donald Trump and Biff Tannen and back the old Biff Tannen and Back to the Future, too. <laughs> I thought it was very much. But no, I, I don't watch House of Cards, so I didn't see that. Go ahead. About Trump, and let's also talk about Carly Fiorina. I'm getting tired of people telling me how smart she is. Yes. Because what I heard from that mini-debate was that she thinks everybody should be surveilled. She's like a thin Chris Christie. And I'm, I'm tired of Chris Christie, too. Look, the question that should have been asked of the, every one of the uh, debate participants, the first one and the second one, should have been, uh, will you uphold your oath of office and will you honor the Constitution? Which no, the but they didn't do that, did they? Did they, Howard? They asked them, are you loyal to the Republican Party? Wasn't that interesting? They wanted them to take a loyalty oath to the Republican Party, but they could care less about the Bill of Rights, about the Constitution. No loyalty oath there. No, and I was there, as I was on hold, I was sitting here thinking, why can't we, the people, uh, create some kind of class action lawsuit for the uh, politicians that don't uphold their oath of office, that absolutely flout their, their uh, oath of office? And one, one last thing about Donald Trump. I don't trust him. But he could be the next vet Jesse Ventura on a grander scale than Minnesota. And if I send a uh, Republican to Washington, as we've just witnessed, I'm going to get socialists. If I send a Democrat to Washington, I'm going to get socialists. So why not send Trump? Yeah, I understand. That's what people are saying. Absolutely. Yeah, it, it, it would be interesting. It would definitely be interesting. And as I said, I don't think we're really going to get, it doesn't really matter who we send as a, a Mr. Smith to Washington. We have to work to cut this thing off at the local and the state level. And if we can't get involved at that level, it isn't going to matter who we elect. I mean, we could elect Rand Paul, who talks about and works for individual liberty or whatever, who has an understanding of the Constitution. Again, Donald Trump is somebody that people are looking at because they're angry at the system. He's the Howard Beale. He's the guy who says, uh, I'm angry as hell and I'm not going to take it anymore. That's why people like him. And I understand. I'm frustrated with all this process, too. But it isn't necessarily going to change anything. It's going to have to be done at the local level. Well, that's it for today's program. Sorry to the other callers we couldn't get to. Join us